Okay. Um, so the aim of my talk is uh, quite simple. I want to present a criterion to distinguish abstract and concrete objects um, because I'm not so satisfied with the existing criteria. So I think that uh, I can come up with a better one and I will justify why I think that my criterion is um, preferable to the existing criteria. But in the first part of my talk, I will outline what um, characteristics a good criterion uh, for the abstract concrete distinction should have. Um, and in the second part of my talk, I discuss some of the existing criteria and point out why I find them lacking. Before in the third part of my talk, I will prefer, uh, I will present what I think is the preferable criterion of distinction. Um, so let's start by noting what the paradigmatic cases for abstract and concrete concrete objects are. So paradigmatic cases for concrete objects include, for example, mountains um, and other microphysical uh, objects, molecules and other microphysical objects, objects, human beings, um, and tokens of such things as sentences, songs, and sonnets. Abstract objects uh, include um, numbers, of course, sets, properties, and types of such things as sentences, songs, and sonnets. These are the clear cases. Maybe a bit more interesting are the controversial cases. What about time itself? Is it abstract or concrete? I think that. Um, at least initially, we have no clear intuition how to categorize time itself. Um, what about the equator of the Earth, abstract or concrete? Again, I would say we have no clear intuition how to categorize it. Um, mental entities uh, like minds or souls, if they exist, um, are maybe clearly not abstract, but the question is, whether that makes them concrete or whether they belong to a third category. So maybe there's a third category, abstract objects, concrete objects, and mental objects. Um, so it's not clear whether mental objects are concrete or non-concrete. Other possible worlds pose a, pose a problem as well. I will talk about them a lot in my talk. Um, and merely possible objects uh, are also controversial. So what about unicorns? Are they concrete? Also, they don't exist on Earth, or are they abstract? Or are they, or do they belong to a third category as well? Uh, or maybe a fourth category in addition to the abstract, the concrete, and the mental? Or what about my older sister? I don't have an older sister, but there are possible worlds in which my older sister exists. So what about my older sister? Is she abstract? Is she concrete? Uh, or is she neither abstract nor concrete, as, for example, Timothy Williamson would assume? So um, at least some of the controversial cases might even be neither abstract nor concrete. And as Nikolai pointed out uh, this morning, um, there might even be room for theories uh, that say that some entities could be as well abstract as con uh, and concrete. Um, but the criteria that I will discuss uh, assume that um, we divide the realm of the being uh, into just two categories, the abstract and the concrete. That's just um, because I cannot discuss all the criteria that there are. Uh, and I will assume criteria that just leave room for two categories. Um, but that's inessential for the aim of my talk. So what are the characteristics of a good abstract concrete distinction? Um, and of course, this list will not be exhaustive, but I think important characteristics are the following ones. Um, first of all, a good abstract concrete distinction should not be too complicated. That's because the abstract concrete distinction is so fundamental in metaphysics. Um, and so, well, in a way, intuitively, that uh, it shouldn't take you half a page to write uh, the distinction down. So um, it should be not be too complicated. 
And of course, it should deliver the right results in the clear cases. So mountains, molecules, and so on should come out at, as concrete. Sets, numbers, uh, properties, and so on should come out as abstract. And it should resolve at least some of the controversial cases. Um, you already heard this morning that, uh, for example, uh, David Lewis said, well, or, or considers uh, the way of examples. We could just say, OK, um, we have clear cases of uh, abstract objects and clear cases of concrete objects. And that's all we can say about uh, the distinction between abstract and concrete objects. Um, that's unsatisfying because it leaves us uh, alone with the controversial cases. A good abstract concrete distinction should give us some guidance how to categorize them. And the more guidance we get, the better. An abstract concrete distinction should be independent of the existence of objects such as numbers or mental entities. So for example, uh, if you believe that there are no numbers, they don't exist, and you come up with a criterion of the abstract concrete distinction according to which numbers would come out as concrete. But you say it don't matter, numbers don't exist anyway. Then it's not a good abstract concrete distinction just because the distinction should be independent from the existence of numbers. Uh, and it's not a good excuse that numbers don't exist anyway. Or if you think that mental entities don't exist and you come out with a uh, an abstract concrete distinction that would make them abstract if they existed, that's not a good distinction either. A good distinction should also be neutral on whether meaningful metaphysical theories are correct. To give you but one example, um, modal realism famously uh, says that other possible worlds are as real as our world. And that's commonly interpreted as meaning that other possible worlds are concrete. While um, opponents of modal realism say that other possible worlds are abstract. So um, if we have an abstract concrete distinction according to which all possible worlds, whether they are conceived as in modal realism or conceived as by the opponents of modal realism come out abstract, that would not be a good criterion for um, the abstract concrete distinction because it would rule out a meaningful metaphysical theory, namely modal realism. Whatever you think about modal realism, um, it should not be ruled out by an abstract concrete distinction, which makes um, other possible worlds abstract from the outset. And lastly, uh, um, an, a good abstract and concrete distinction should be explicit about whether there might be objects that are neither abstract nor concrete. I don't say that a good distinction has to take a specific uh, or has to say, for example, that there are no objects that are neither abstract nor concrete, but at least it should be explicit about whether there are such objects. Okay, let's consider the following criteria um, for uh, the distinction between abstract and concrete objects. Um, the first is probably the most prominent one, and it's a good one, I think. Uh, in the Q&A session of yesterday's talk, Oyster and Linnebo uh, said that this uh, is the criterion for the abstract concrete distinction that uh, he finds best. It just says an object is concrete if and only if it is located in space and time and abstract otherwise. A closely related criterion uh, is that an object is concrete if and only if it enters into causal relations and abstract otherwise. I say closely related, they do not uh, categorize every um, object in the same way. Um, the equator of the Earth, for example, is clearly located in space and time. We can exactly say where it is located, but it does not enter into causal relations, um, or at least it seems so. So according to criterion one, the equator of the Earth is concrete, and according to criterion two, the equator of the Earth 
is abstract. Um, I think that one and um, especially two have some implausible consequences. Um, for example, um, if I say such a sentence like, this song causes me to weep every time I hear it, then I talk about a specific type of song. I mentioned that every time I hear it, it causes me to weep. So it's not a token of that song, it's a type of the song. And it's perfectly legitimate to say, it causes me to weep. So to say of a type of something that it causes something. So that seems to make, um, according to criterion two, uh, types of thought songs um, concrete, whereas they are clearly abstract. Okay, you can say, well, that's all the way, or only a derivative sense um, of uh, uh, a causal connection. In fact, uh, in the primary sense, causal relations uh, only connect um, events. Uh, and therefore, we shouldn't take types of songs, for example, as concrete entities, uh, because they do not really enter into causal relations. Just uh, It's just a way of speaking that uh, leads us astray. But think about um, macrophysical objects such as mountains. They do not enter into causal relations in this primary well way as well. They are not events. Uh, a mountain does not cause anything. Um, so if you say, OK, only the primary causal relations uh, can give us the concrete objects, then probably mountains wouldn't be uh, concrete. And that's also not what we want. So um, causal relations um, do not seem to categorize the objects uh, in a good way. Um, and even events, um, if you uh, have a Louisian view of events, according to which events are sets of spatiotemporal locations, events are sets. And as sets, they are abstract. Sets are one of our uh, prime uh, paradigmatic examples for abstract objects. So it seems that um, the only thing that is concrete according to the second uh, criterion, namely events, um, should have come out abstract at least if we regard events uh, in the Louisian way. And Louisian events might even be a problem for the first criterion because um, events are clearly located in space and time, but if they are sets of spatiotemporal locations, they seem to be abstract nevertheless. Um, but I think uh, the real problem for the first criterion and also for the second one is not so much that they uh, do miscategorize the clear cases, but they cannot deal with several of the uh, controversial cases. Time itself, is it located in space and time? I do not have clear intuitions here. Souls, are they located in space and time? Again, I do not have clear intuitions. And maybe even, um, uh, more importantly, um, merely possible objects like my older sister, are they located in space and time? If my older sister existed, she would be located in space and time. But as she doesn't exist, does that make her abstract? Or is she still concrete, but concrete in another possible world, whatever that is? So it does not, we, we, we do not have. Um, a good way of categorizing merely possible objects. And uh, it's completely hopeless with other possible worlds. Are they located in space and time? Well, in a way, they are their own space and time. Um, so we cannot convincingly answer the question whether they are located in space and time and whether other possible worlds are um, abstract or concrete. And in particular, we cannot use our criterion to say um, that they are abstract according to uh, <clears throat> modal anti-realism and uh, concrete according to modal realism. 
Here's another crit criterion uh, from, I think, Hoffman and Rosenkranz, uh, which I quite like. It says that an object is concrete if and only if it belongs to an ontological category of objects to which possibly belong objects with temporal and sp or spatial parts and abstract otherwise. Um, so the idea here is that on the highest level of generality, um, we just have the category entity. And on the second highest level of generality, we have the abstract and the concrete as uh, fundamental categories. And on the third highest level of generality, we have several ontological categories such as substance, set, property, events, boundary, time, and so on, um, whose characteristic is that they cannot be subsumed under another ontological category on the same level. And on the lower le still lower levels, we have ontological categories that can be reduced, or we, we have um, things that can be reduced to things uh, um, or subsumed to uh, under things uh, of the ontological categories on our third level. So, for example, souls um, are concrete according to this criterion because souls are substances, and substances. Um, and, and other substances, for example, are trees or animals and so on. So souls belong to an ontological category to which belong uh, objects like trees and animals with spatial or temporal parts, and therefore souls as well are concrete. So that's how this criterion is supposed to work. <coughs> um, and I, I think it uh, works quite well with categorizing the clear cases. And it also works at least partly well with uh, the controversial cases. But um, the problem with this criterion is I think that there is no theory independent way to decide what ontological categories there are. I already mentioned substance as an ontological category. But um, why shouldn't we have, for example, one ontological category called uh, material stuff or whatever, or matter, and another called souls? Um, why uh, do we have to subsume both of them under substance in order to uh, find out that souls are concrete or something like that? Of course, you can do that, but th uh, then you already have to have a theory of substances or something like that. Plus, for example, as I mentioned, events can be regarded as sets of uh, spatio-temporal locations, but they need not be regarded as such. So are events an ontological category of their own on the required level of generality? Well, that depends on your theory of events. So ontological categories, what ontological categories there are is not theory independent. And I think um, a good, abstract concrete distinction should be a uh, theory independence should not take uh, um, or should not give us different results uh, depending on what metaphysical theories we find more attractive and uh, in particular this is a special case of the first point uh, there is also no non-arbitrary way to decide to which more general ontological category mere possibilia and other possible worlds belong. Um, do mere possibilia belong to substances as well? Is my older sister a substance or is she a set of sentences or whatever? What about other possible worlds? Are worlds a category of their own or, or are, they, are they also sets of, uh, for example, sentences or something like that? That depends on uh, our specific, specific th theories of possibilia and other possible worlds, and it's not uh, theory independent. Um, here's a very simple criterion that works quite well as well with the uh, clear cases and resolves um, the uh, controversial cases uh, also quite well. It says, an object is concrete if and only if it exists contingently, while an object is abstract 
if it exists at all, uh, if it exists, uh, while an abstract object, if it exists at all, exists necessarily. So, um, so for example, uh, the equator of the earth exists contingently because it exists uh, not in every possible world. It exists only in those possible worlds uh, in which the earth exists. Or souls ex uh, exist contingently because um, what, whatever exactly so souls are and whether or not they exist, um, if they exist, they exist in some possible worlds, but uh, not in all, and that makes them contingent. So they are come out concrete and so on. But um, if we take modal realism again and ask uh, what about other possible worlds, then uh, we get a problem because um, other possible worlds would come out abstract. Why is that? Uh, modal realism is a non-empirical view, a philosophical view, that it means that if it's true, it's true with necessity. So if modal realism is true and other possible worlds are as real as our world, then that holds from the point of view of all possible worlds. So um, uh, they are necessarily as real as our world. And that means that they would be abstract objects. But that's just uh, not what modal realists intend. So criterion four cannot uh, do justice to the theory of modal realism. And um, there's another meaningful metaphysical theory uh, put forward by Timothy Williamson, namely necessitism, uh, the view that necessarily everything is necessarily so something or put a bit plainer, um, everything that exists, exists uh, with necessity. And of course, given our criterion for that would mean that there would be no concrete objects. I don't want this to discuss necessitism uh, in detail here. I just want to point out that it does not work well with um, our criterion for. So that would mean that criterion for isn't able to do justice to a meaningful metaphysical theory. But we can add a uh, slightly modify criterion four, and then we uh, arrive at um, the distinction that I prefer. An object is concrete if and only if this object, given that it exists at all, exists as part of some but not all possible worlds. And an object is abstract if and only if this object, given that it exists at all, exists as part of every possible world. Mm. In the same way as criterion four, um, the uh, clear cases of abstract and concrete objects uh, are uh, categorized uh, in a plausible way, um, and it resolves uh, the um, controversial cases. And unlike four, Five allows us that uh, allows that concrete objects exist necessarily, because um, take me for example. Um, according to necessitism, uh, I exist necessarily because everything that exists exists necessarily. But I am only part of some and not of all possible worlds. That means I am still concrete. Um, whereas given necessitism, I would come out abstract uh, according to four. Or take my older sister. Um, she's also part of some, but not all possible worlds. So she's concrete as well. Um, and uh, we have no problem with modal realism because whether or not other possible worlds are concrete depends on whether or not they are real. Um, if, another, if other possible worlds are real, as modal realism assumes, then they are part of some, but not all possible worlds. Why is that? Well, they are at least a non-proper part of themselves. Um, so they are part of some possible worlds. And of course, they are not part of all possible worlds because they, are not, uh, they, they do not belong um, to many other possible worlds uh, that are different from themselves. 
given that moral realism is wrong, um, other possible worlds would come out as abstract because then uh, there would be sets of sentences or something like that, and sets uh, exist in the same way in every possible world. So they would exist, uh, if they exist at all, as uh, um, something that belongs to every possible world and that would make them abstract. So we get exactly the right results even um, for necessitism and for modal realism. So uh, you've noticed that the role of mere possibilia and other possible worlds uh, played an important role in my uh, justification of my preferred criterion. And I think that's um, a good thing because mere possibilia and other possible worlds are a metaphysically highly relevant kind of objects. Um, we need these objects uh, in our metaphysical theories at very uh, various places, and they play a very fundamental role in contemporary metaphysical theories. And because they are quite distinct from our paradigm cases, uh, they make for good test objects. Um, uh, we, we can uh, use them to show how uh, encompassing an abstract concrete distinction is, because uh, if an abstract concrete distinction can categorize them in a convincing way, then uh, it can categorize a yeah, very different kind of uh, object as well, and not only the um, normal objects that we encounter uh, in the, our world. And um, yeah, mere possibilia and other possible worlds are to be handled with care because otherwise meaningful theories are ruled out for inadequate reasons, as I explained with uh, um, regard to modal realism or necessitism. Um, here's one corollary that uh, might seem like a counterexample for my view, but I think it isn't. God, uh, if God exists at all, um, would be concrete or at least it seems so. So uh, uh, God seems to be a paradigmatic case for concrete objects. But according to the ontological proof, God, God's existence is claimed to be derived only from the concept of God. So if this proof were true, it's not true, but if this proof were true, it would be true in every possible world because the concept of God exists in every possible world as a concept. And if that's the only thing that we need to derive God's existence, that um, would make God uh, um, an object in every possible world, which in turn would make God abstract according to my crit criteria. Um, but that's not a counter example to my criterion, I think, because on second glance, uh, it, it seems to me just right. Um, because God as conceived in the ontological proof is very different from God as conceived in, say, the teleological proof, which derives God's existence from um, a, the specific structure the world has, from the beauty, elegance, uh, and so on that we find in the world. Um, so if God is really, if God's existence were really provable by the ontological proof, then um, God would exist uh, for conceptual reasons. And given that, it seems for me quite plausible to say that then God would be abstract. Okay, I conclude by just repeating the most important thing uh, of my talk, namely the preferable distinction between the abstract and the concrete. Um, it's this, an object is concrete if and only if this object, given that it exists at all, exists as part of some but not all possible worlds. And it's abstract if and only if this object, given that it exists at all, exists as part of every possible world. Okay, thank you. Any questions? 
Uh, yes, Valentina, please. Uh, so can you hear me? Uh, very well. Okay, so thank you very much for the talk. I have two questions actually. So the first is just a small point on uh, the second criterion for uh, the distinction. So um, yeah, the criterion concerning uh, causality. And you said that you have contraexample because you have, um, let's say abstract objects which are causal efficacious. And you mentioned your, um, like the, the type song which can affect you. And uh, yeah, I think that the, uh, the opponent can easily re reply that what affects you is not the type song, but the token song. Mm -hmm. And maybe that if you embrace a materialistic conception of mind, you can say that you are affected by the song because of your brain functioning, there's something concrete. And uh, so I was wondering whether um, it is maybe better to take fictional characters such as, I don't know, Sherlock Holmes, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. to be causally efficacious because I'm, yeah, I can be affected by, uh, by Doyle novel. And mm -hmm. um, maybe, it, it, yeah, it can be argued that that then is my idea of Sherlock Holmes that affect me and not Sherlock Holmes. But then idea are maybe upset objects. So it's, mm -hmm. I think that this example is better placed than type songs, mm -hmm. I'm sure, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Um, well, uh, that's why I formulated the sentence in the way um, this song causes me to weep every time I hear it. Um, it's not a specific token that causes me to weep, um, but uh, it's connected to the type of song. Every time I hear this uh, a token of this specific type, um, then it causes me to weep. So it, it's not so directly to, um, related to the token. In the same way as uh, in your Sherlock Holmes example, uh, if I'm fascinated by Sherlock Holmes, it doesn't matter whether I read this token of uh, a sh the Sherlock Holmes stories or that token, or uh, yeah, uh, it's, um, it's the content of the, uh, the books that cause me to uh, be fascinated by Sherlock Holmes and not the specific token or uh, the specific book, a copy of the book that causes me to be fascinated. So I uh, w w want my song example to be understood in the way uh, of the uh, book example that you gave, that it's not a specific token, but it's every um, token of a specific song or every copy of a specific book that causes me um, to feel in a certain way. Um, and of course, as I said, you can say it's not so much um, the type of the song or the type of the book that uh, um, enters into the causal relations, but it's the event of, for example, my reading the book or my hearing the song and so on. But if we regard only events as uh, the causal rela relata, then we have problems with, for example, mountains and molecules and so on as well. Um, so we cannot just uh, say causal relata need to be events. But if we don't uh, say that they need to be events, if we allow for mountains and molecules and so on as well, then it's hard to find a criterion not to allow for types of songs or types of books as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and another question from Samuel Dixon. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. That was, uh, was really interesting. Um, so it's just, I think it's just a clarificatory question, really. Um, so earlier on in, in the talk, you said the a good criteria, a good distinction between the abstract and concrete should should in some way be independent of the existence of um, yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm independently existence of objects and if i'm getting you right it, it you said something like you know um if the distinction was to say that oh well numbers would, would come out concrete but in fact concrete objects don't, don't exist uh, in fact numbers don't exist that that would be wrong is that is that right yeah i guess i'm, I'm just wondering why and i this will probably be more apparent when i give my talk later on but um yeah i just i'm, I'm yeah why do you think that um 
so in a way, uh, an, uh, my argument for an abstract concrete distinction should be independent from my argument about whether there are numbers or whether there aren't. Um, and if my argument for an abstract concrete distinction only works well, if I give an additional argument to the point that there are no numbers, then you either have to believe um, both arguments uh, or you uh, yeah, uh, cannot believe uh, or cannot plausibly believe my abstract concrete distinction. And be because these questions are independent, what is a good abstract concrete distinction and are there numbers? Um, my argument for an abstract concrete distinction should not depend on this uh, thesis that there are no numbers. Yeah, okay. no, that that um, that makes sense. I don't. Yeah, I don't think that's that's how I was thinking of it. But no, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Okay.